go. Greetings and salutations, all you absolutely gorgeous individuals. Welcome to another Happy Up League Online. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. And we are, I'm not even going to call it a stop time machine. It's a just bizarro alternate universe we're stepping into with today's Gen G versus D plus Kia series because the pick ban for this series was off the rails in more ways than one. Holy cow. We've had a relatively stale meta a lot of times that we've gone through a couple of these important patches, important moments of the year and going through these big tournaments. Not the case this morning in the LCK. Absolutely wild pick and ban. What's coming through at the end of the day, what's being played? Yes, this Gen G versus D plus Kia series delivering right out of the gate. At the very least, the first game is standard-ish, standard enough, you know? We get, okay, a malphite Cassante matchup, sure, but mostly, aside from a Ziggs bot, which is pretty meta these days, uh, pretty standard. I will say I have never seen a malphite ulting away from a team fight more often than Kingen had to in this game. Uh, and yes, and you can guess that that equals a loss for D plus Akia right away. If that's the statement we're making about a Malphite on your team, there's no chance you're winning that game because yes, a lot of defensive ults coming through from the Malphite in this one, certainly taking a little bit longer than I think most people would expect given the advantages, given the strength of that Genji was able to uh, build up in this game, but more or less a cautious approach from this Gen G, even though they did have the advantage, they did get the drop, they did get all these plays off to get the early advantages on their side. Once they pick up Mountain Soul, it is a go for Gen G. They pressure on through and take the Nexus. Yeah, and really all it takes for them to get a big lead, get the first Baron, is one pick on a support. And when you have an incredibly fed Ziggs, the other four members, again, with no Malphite out because Kingen used it earlier to escape. There's zero pressure. They can't even get through the minefield of Zig. So an easy 5v4 to get the Baron and uh, eventually coast to a game one victory. So heading into the second game, you might say that Ziggs was a bit of an issue. We couldn't do much, but no, no, that's not the issue. We got something else to prioritize. We get a first pick, Nasus for Showmaker, which we've already seen him pull out, and then you get the clutch Garen Flex to close things out for Chobi. We've heard all about this being spammed in solo queue, but here it is, 2024. It is a Garen Nasus mid lane matchup. The thing everyone wants to see. Two of arguably the some of the best players in the world, in Chobi, arguably the best player in the world, playing some of the most beginner friendly champions that we get to see out on summoner's rift the nasus all susan coming out through in that first pick for d plus that's how they feel make a change make a pivot get some current meta power in our hands for this game too to shift the tables and gen g has the ultimate counter the ultimate answer of the garen absolutely negating a lot of the advantages that this nasus was built to have in this game didn't matter. Didn't get off the floor. Didn't get off the ground is the way that Gen G was able to cooperate on this one because it wasn't just about the Garen in the mid lane. It was flanked by two ADCs coming through for this Gen G composition. One of them being that Corky in the top lane. Yes, sir. Yeah, and it again worked against the melee matchup in Olaf, even though Kingen got out to eight kills pretty quickly in this game. He just couldn't really do anything. The, the pick potential of a three screen away Maokai ulti coming in and then a sprinting blitz crank from Lahens grabbing you out of that route worked time and time again. A second deathless game in a row uh, for Pays on that Ziggs pick. And this whole game, they, D Plus was just trying to feed CS to aiming in the side lanes. He was barely there for a team fight. My man only did 400 more damage than Moham support Poppy in this game. Which is completely unacceptable. It's one of those type of things where you understand, uh, you know, we have to make a drastic choice. We have to find a way to immediately start pumping some economy into our ADC so we can have the damage. You kind of need that ADC there even in the first place. And to have that type of setup and to have that execution, 
on the side of Genji as you lay down. Maokai Ultimate from away from where you even were scrolling around on your screen. Le Hens coming in at 200 miles per hour on this Blitzcrank, which, by the way, I don't think we see anyone quite play Blitzcrank support the way that Le Hens does. He just has this insane bloodthirstiness that he plays no it one like else singed. Can... Yeah, he plays it insane, like a true madman. And then you combine it with the clean mechanics on the zigs and understanding of how to maximize it that we are seeing pays have, that is the next level from Gen G. This game two, very much in control, much faster than game one, quickly up to nothing for Gen G. And you would think that would, you know, give a neon flashing billboard sign to D plus to ban Ziggs. Second straight game, they can't do any damage to him. They can't push against him on any turrets. And yet, they still decide that the yiddle, little chaotic Yordle in the bot lane is not the issue. And they go one further and say, Nasus wasn't the issue for us either. Let's first pick Blinded again. But this time, our secret angle is we'll put it in the top lane for King. And we get the exact same Nasus Garen matchup, but in the top lane. But this time, there's a lane swap, and King in really doesn't get to play the game. Oh, oh boy, he really does not get to play the game. This is about as, as bad as it ever can get for anyone. I don't care what lane you're in, but specifically that top lane. And you know how bad that's going to snowball, how much it's going to set you behind in that type of situation. I'm going to pick like the Nasus that needs to start getting that type of advantage, needs to start stacking them up, building it up and being a pressure. That wasn't the case that was going to happen in this one for Beside D plus Kia, you had initial gank getting on through, making sure you get the teleport, you know, out through and you're dead on that one. And then the walk to lane, you're dead again quickly. Two nothing for Gen G. Even though you get one back in the mid lane, you know that it's gonna be that type of game. And it was pressured on immediately from the side of Gen G in this game three. All you had to do was look at the player camps for D+, especially in this third game. Kingen is straight up yucking it up, laughing, like, what am I supposed to, how do I play this game if you're Nasus? And then Showmaker gets ganked mid, and his is a little less uh, fun, lighthearted. He, my man looks tilted to oblivion after he gets caught out on that Talia, and he looked tilted in a lot of these team fights as it went on. Um, Canyon has one of the best Skarner games I think we've seen anyone have since the rework. And the other egregious thing in this draft for D+, how are you going to put aiming on Seraphine paired with a Leona? Ah. That is the other wild thing, because we've talked about Seraphine actually in the last couple of days and mentioned there's got to be a, a place, a time, a figure, a composition where you can work her in because she's actually in an okay position and she can be one of these options that pushes and gives you something a little bit different in that bottom lane. This one, and at this moment, was certainly not the way that you were going to find victory in this series. As you laid out, pairing it with that Leona as well, an extra one where you're not really... You're not getting enough. Yes, you're locking it down. Yes, you're getting some CC. Yes, you've got some tankiness. But it's not going to matter when you're faced up against a Corky and a Ziggs that are just free firing on the side of Gen G. Throw in the Skarner making all the tankiness and all the extra CC moves for this team. It was over. It was over very much so from the from the get go in this game three. Clearly a mental boom at this point and one that's, you know, again, it's it's not any shame really on the side of D plus key. It's completely understandable to be broken this way by a Gen G. Bye. Again, a zigs that gets through in the draft. So many times we talk about it. Find the consistent angle in your defeats and where you analyze them. Yes, some of it can be on execution. But sometimes it's as simple as going, okay, do it with something that's not that. You didn't even challenge Gen G to that today. At least they killed Pays a couple times in that third <laughs> game. He doesn't go deathless the whole series. But uh, this is now, since Chovy has joined Gen G, D plus hasn't beat them. This, that's like three years we're approaching that they've been unable to even beat them. And you go and you look at the differences here, and right, we do feel better about this D plus Kia than we did at the at last in spring. And you go back to spring, and this was a D plus Kia that was able to take Gen G to five games, a full on series. Now, three games. 
That is that either a statement? And about it was how never in doubt that Gen G was going to win any of these games. By the way, no. And is that a statement about D plus Kia or a statement about Gen G? Because yes, D plus Kia is better, and I feel stronger about them this split than I did last split. But Gen G is even better and even further ahead than they have ever been in this top seat atop the throne of the League of Legends world. Yeah, they were hardly tested on the day. Now the question is how much of this Game 3 tilt carries over for D-plus as they head into that loser's bracket uh, to play, obviously, the loser of the next round. And that next round of LCK action is, yeah, it's a little bit of a banger when you're talking T1 Hanwha life get going the very next day and obviously you look at regular season and you should say Hanwha should be favored in this they beat them both times T1 only took a single game off of them and a lot of the wins were pretty convincing and a lot of those wins came directly from the top side of the map for Hanwha that's immediately where you're looking in this matchup specifically Zeus versus his grandpappy Doran on that top side. It almost is a matchup where regardless of either player's form heading into it, we've ended with the same result. And that has been Doran domination for whatever squad he's been rolling with against Zeus. And we step into that once again in this series and it goes up against what we saw in the previous series for T1, the lead up to this one and how you can talk about where their power level was in building up. Zeus having important performances, impactful moments for the squad is certainly something that you haven't seen at the lowest of moments, the lowest points for this T1 lineup. So you can bank on that a little bit if you're T1. But as you laid out, the history, the numbers, they're all there for Doran. That is certainly where you got to be putting the advantage in this series early for Hanwha Life. And how about, you know, obviously the picks that Zeus were doing in that series against KT. We got the Bane. We've seen other 80 carries uh, coming out of him. And now you see what this pick ban was like in the D-plus Gen G series. And I feel like T1's going to be having a absolute field day in this pick ban, whether it's flexing champions into different roles or just pulling something out, either top lane or bot side for Kyria that Hanwha Life is absolutely not prepared for. I'm going to say maybe a three out of the four, you know, a four out of the five, whatever signs are pointing towards Hanwha life from the regular season. And the signs that are pointing towards T1 are the signs that are from this series today, Gen G and D plus Kia, where you see just how open the meta can be in this playoffs and what we have right now and how different it can be and what options, you know, as far as flexing as well that we just see with the composition with Gen G flexing through all three of these, the Garen, the Ziggs, and the uh, rolling through, uh, you know, excuse me, sorry, I'm blanking on it. Corky. Ziggs, Corky. Corky, there we go, of course, the Corky. Trying to erase it from your memory, I get it, you know. You might want to, and if you're having to go up against him in this one, against someone like Zeus, we talk about these ranged options in the top side that you talked about with Vayne, Corky can be thrown into that type of list. So if you're believing in the meta, the wackiness, the openness of it right now, and the cooking of T1, that is your angle in this series to find uh, what I'm going to call right now an upset, even as crazy as that sounds to say, against T1 in a playoff series. Yeah, I mean, if you removed the team names, you would 100% be saying Hanwha should be and will be favorites heading into this set. But T1, regardless of how regular seasons go, T1 in playoffs versus in the regular season is always a different beast. And how about the other guy we haven't highlighted from the last series who was the real star was Guma playing that Nyla pick. The confidence, the alpha status that this dude is playing at. All you need to see are the comms where you have four T1 members walking away saying, don't fight, don't fight, don't fight. And Guma just screaming, look, 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 look. And he goes in 1v4 to set something up. So Guma is feeling himself right now. I think that it's been noticed by the rest of the T1 members as, you know, times have gone on in this year and as you've had the ups and downs all, of course, uh, all over the place, they've noticed that what has been a pretty darn consistent one is the performance of Gumayushi and what he can do. So I think they're trusting in that decision-making in these big moments to make these type of big plays for the team. Absolutely. One of the guys that you got to be looking at and you're looking at through and finding where do you find these edges for T1? That can be one down in the bottom lane because Viper has been good. I don't think he's been excellent for this Hanwha Life team. He certainly has been there. He has been dependable 
I don't think he's taken it to that ultra next level. And that's one of the things that you have to be able to do to separate yourself in a playoff series. Guma's shown us that already, these playoffs. I think you can cook it up for another series. I think Guma's honestly been trained during some of these, you know, the biggest of slumps that T1 has had this year. And even going back last year, pre-summer playoffs, Guma's kind of had to step up and do a lot more probably than he's accustomed to doing when he's had multiple guys not playing at a high level. He has remained that consistent force and carry potential for basically the entire tenure that he's been on T1. And I feel like that has been some hyperbolic chamber level of training for him to get to that next level. Uh, last matchup here for me to look at is I'm, I'm favoring Zeka right now. I feel like even though T1 looked a lot better last series, we're still waiting for Faker to kind of rev up to that playoff level. Yes, that's going to be one of the things that I think you step away from the last series knowing that he was impactful, but it wasn't the unkillable Demon King. Of course, the legendary status that you can build him up to. His global taunt certainly was in effect. That's certainly something that I think we can count on always Best being. passive in the game something that you're going to have to account for in these games if you're T1. But look, going into this one, I'm looking at that mid lane and, and you know, knowing how open it can possibly be, the type of champions that are there in the play styles. Someone like Zeka, if he's hot, he can be that type of pressure that does set something like Faker behind, does put him into some uh, more difficult positions where he can and has, unfortunately, made more mistakes than we are accustomed to seeing over the course of his career. So that is something... I think you got to be worried about a little bit if you're on the side of T1. The other one for me is still going to be Peanut, the veteran in the jungle and what he brings to the table. You know, you, we talk all the times about Doran being Zeus's father. Peanut, every now and then, does have that same effect against owner. He is also liable to sometimes forget what's going on and, and put on the SKT peanut jacket and throw it back over. To T1, yes. So we got to be careful about that one, but that's certainly an area that I'm also still uh, identifying in this series. And now that he has the options more, like Sejuani and Maokai, to play these tanky junglers that are, you know, can absolutely be paired alongside all the AP junglers that we're seeing in the current meta, you feel even a little bit better about Peanut. But T1 versus Gen G feels like an inevitability. The question is, are we getting it in the winner's final or are we waiting all the way till the grand final because t1 in a loser's bracket run it's always a fun time <laughs> oh i'm wearing the t1 hoodie i have to try and put forward the best foot for the organization and the best foot forward for the organization is that lower bracket run i'm telling you right now <laughs> we're running behind with our tails between our legs away from papa doran at this top part of it We'll handle him in the lower bracket when time comes from when they lose to Gen G eventually. That's how I see things playing out in the LCK. Hey, we don't need to be spoiled with two T1 Gen G matchups. So loser bracket T1 is probably actually the best storyline uh, to see play out for these LCK playoffs. The worst storyline to see play out in the LCS is an absolute mega choke job from Cloud9. And listen... I'm not, I'm not trying to summon this or anything, but with the way that the FlyQuest series ended, maybe there's a little bit more concern. I know 100 Thieves or Dignitas, either one, are a complete shell of the other top three teams in the LCS. But back in my mind, we've had some Cloud9 rosters that have dominated for 80% of the year and then somehow choke it away in playoffs. I'm hoping and praying... That doesn't happen to this roster, and it shouldn't, right? It really shouldn't. It really shouldn't. The LCS is where anything can happen, is what I will say about this one for Cloud9. What they're facing up against, and either Dignitas or 100 Thieves, either one of them that comes out of there, you got to be the favorites. You have massive advantages, I would say, when you look through lane by lane and you're going through it for Cloud9. Again, assuming that is the level that we're going to be getting from these players. And that is where it gets a little bit dangerous because as we've seen with that series against FlyQuest, that is not a guarantee with this Cloud9 roster just yet. They don't have that type of resume. They don't have these type of performances that you can look back on and bank on to say that, nope, they're going to find a way to bounce back. They're going to find their way to get through this one. There is that little bit of doubt, a little bit of question making that you come into when you see how bad how things were against FlyQuest. With that in mind, 
even if it's as bad as that, maybe even a sprinkling worse, which that's that's really bad there, folks. You got to believe that it's going to be enough to get by either Dignitas or 100 Thieves. And, you know, the truth is the early game in like three out of the four games against FlyQuest were still good for Cloud9. And I think pre-15 minutes, they might still be the best team in the LCS. That's just purely how good their players are individually at laning, how good Blabber is at taking control of the jungle early. But it's when you have to start grouping up, when you have to start looking at the bigger scope of the map in a macro sense that what Cloud9 falls behind. The laning's probably enough to just steamroll through Dignitas or 100 Thieves, but they really need to be leveling up post-15 minutes if they want to make any noise against even TL or FlyQuest, let alone at a World Championship. And I think flat out here, this does need to be a, a you know a challenge issue type of situation to Jojo Pyeon. This is the moment. This is the time where you got to find a way to have a signature moment for Cloud9, for this new organization. You know, put that fork down in the ground and say, this is my time for Cloud9 and really show it. And that's something that I think we've been missing throughout his time on this team, you know, again, one of the moves that we knew for a long time that was going to happen, rumored in the offseason type of thing, talking about it. And so excited to get this domestic talent on this domestic prime team like Cloud9 and where it can lead to. Where it can lead to shouldn't be in this situation against Dignitas and 100 Thieves. That's where it's got to step up and it starts in that matchup for me, for, Dig uh, for Jojo Pion. And, uh, you know, the main thing we've heard, scrims for Berserker, I think I heard him say... 15 deaths for Jojo in one of the scrims. He said he's never seen that before. So he's impressed that my man's making history for Cloud9. But anything short of a swift 3-0 out of 100, uh, against 100 Thieves or Dignitas from Cloud9 will be disappointing. They need to get some momentum heading into a rematch against either Team Liquid or FlyQuest in the next round. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark with all you beautiful people. As always, thanks for hanging out and we will catch you on that flippity flip.